Food Service Power Plant Network. Yo, what's up, friends? Um, it would be an understatement for me to say, I think we're going to have a lot of fun, and I'm really excited. Uh, to, you know, first of all, welcome to Monday night. It is unique tonight. I mean, tonight, the first night, or I guess second night, that it's gotten dark earlier. I had to be intentional about walking Molly earlier before it got too dark. And um, it feels different. I feel like there's going to be a lot of work in the next month in the group around staying positive amidst the darkness that comes so early and like finding ways to smile. So uh, let's all think of that together. Next, you know, one of the ways you can always, here's a little tool, tool for any time you're feeling down, anxious, whatever, laughter. Laughter is one of those tools that we can use, which releases some of those happy chemicals in our brain, which makes us smile, which helps us have a better perspective. When I first started doing videos, before there was even a food service power plant network, right after COVID, the first one was on laughter. And my last 15 minutes is Paul Bartelt from Volrath and I have been talking. All I can do is laugh and smile. And uh, so I think we're going to have a fun time tonight. Listen, there, there isn't a person in our industry who doesn't know Volrath. Volrath has been around like 150 million years. Uh, I think it predated George Washington. Nah, probably not close, but or probably not there, but we're getting there. It's It's been around forever. It stood the test of time. It's a manufacturer here in the States that everyone knows, everyone respects and relies on because it represents quality. Um, it represents you, you know the States. So many good things about who we are. And Paul Bartelt is its CEO with a really fun story. He came to be the CEO through a, I won't say a side door, but maybe not the most traditional way. Uh, with some fun degrees and backgrounds, et cetera. And he's going to spend an hour with us tonight. Now, a couple of things. First, grab a notepad and pen. Inevitably, there will be, uh, I bet there will be also jokes you hear tonight that you're going to want to write down and tell your neighbor. But number two, there's going to be things in Paul's story that you're going to want to hear that are going to be relevant to your story and your growth. There will be moments that he just shares something off the cuff that will mean something and impact you in a way. And I want you to make sure you get it down and write notes so you can start putting it into practice or thinking about it or whatever that is, or put a quote up on your wall. The other thing is you can always ask questions or you can comment. So boom, I'm just putting the fake duck. But if you go in and you can type in comments, questions, if you go to StreamYard forward slash Facebook, you can actually type in your name and we'll be able to see you. I will also be looking on my phone so that I can uh, do my best to see you as well. Let's see if I can get there right now. Boom, here we are. Uh, David Maxwell's in the house. Yo, David, we've got a lot of friends. This is great. So uh, get ready for a fun night. Paul Bartel, yo, brother. Hey, how you doing after an intro like that? I feel, I'm feeling the pressure, man. I'm you should. The pressure. There, you should be squirming right now because this is a high pressure scenario, and I'm a really uncomfortable interviewer. Oh, oh, well, awesome. And right now, <laughs> my marketing people are probably the most uncomfortable because they're probably thinking to themselves. How is he going to destroy our brand tonight? So there we go. <laughs> Everybody's uncomfortable. You know what? Let's give it a shot. Uh, let's let's see what we can do. And you know what? Here's the challenge. To the marketing people, you're going to have to find a way to spin this into something really positive for you guys. And that'll be a fun cha cha challenge. Kudos to the person who can. Paul, listen, um, thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. When we were prepping, like when we were talking ahead of time, you got a call. And uh, from your wife asking you if you could really quickly go and put forks on the skid steer. And when I heard you say that, I'm thinking, is skid steer another term for dining room table? Or so tell me, tell me about your world that would involve you putting forks on the skid steer. Well, my world is uh, when I'm done being the CEO guy, I, I'm the farmer guy, right? So, um, so we have a 40 acre horse farm so in this case my my wife was out uh, hauling a couple horses back and she got a call from a friend of ours who's dropping off some wood uh and so she's got to pull some pallets off the back of a truck and we don't have a fork truck but we have fork truck tines we attach to our tractor bucket or our skid steer bucket so that's just a another day in the life of a farming ceo Wow. So you're, you've got a 40 acre farm, by the way, Rich Malik, he's in the house. Yo, Rich. He says Volrath factory authorized service center. Malik, cares, New Jersey in the building. Yo, Rich. Boom. Oh there we go. Heck yeah. Um, what, what are you, so what are you doing on your 40 acre farm? Raising horses, growing hay. Cool. Shoveling poop. Th that's a, that's a thing. That's a real that's thing. A, that's a thing. Uh, end of my day. It's the, 
uh, the farthest thing away from sitting on a computer, right? So yeah, I get to go outside and, and work with my hands and, and uh, be out in nature. So that's my piece. Has that always been, I mean, were you raised that way? Was that something that's been a part of your entire life journey or something that you found along the way? No, it's it's a demonstration of my awesome negotiation skills because when my daughter was three, some friends of ours uh, got us got her into riding horses and I was a tough ass dad and I'm like, here, give me the limits. You know, this is what it's going to be. This is what it's not going to be. We'll lease, we'll, we'll do this. We won't do this and, you know whatever the heck it is, you know, 15 years later, I have a horse farm. So I'm a tremendous negotiator, held the line and the line kept on moving and moving, moving, moving. But uh, I went training for anything in the world. And, you know, all through school, my kids, uh, you know, did chores and learned how to do hard work. And, you know, my wife and I spent a lot of super good quality time together outside. So and during the pandemic, let me tell you, having 40 acres to wander around was a gift. Oh, I bet. I bet. It sounds, um, I mean, being outside, working with your hands, getting sweaty, getting away from technology feels to, I mean, I've, that's never been a part of my reality, but it, it seems so life-giving to go out and create something, to watch something, you know, you plant and you watch it come to fruition. Um, you teach hard work. It seems like a real gift. It is. You know, I just harvested all my potato crop yesterday. So there you go. Awesome, man. I love it. Suzanne Supli is in the house. Hi, Suzanne. Hey, Suzanne. Long time no see. How fun is that? Uh, Suzanne wants to know, can you negotiate one of those $8,000 colored toilets to put in it? <laughs> With or without the bidet option, Suzanne. That's the critical choice. <laughs> that... Oh, man, there's so many places we go. That sounds outstanding. Uh, something on my bucket list. We'll put it that way. Uh, something what, on my bucket using list. Using a bidet, Jason, or what? Well, I've heard they're I mean, pretty wow. awesome, Paul. I mean, I don't know. Have you ever used one? I used to work uh, at a company that made them, so I, I will, uh, I'll play the fifth. <laughs> there you go. Enough said. I got gotcha. you. But what do you prefer? <laughs> wow. There are many different ways you can become squeaky clean. <laughs> there we go. Love it. Oh, this is great. Okay, Paul, um, you're you're the CEO of Volrath, you know, one of the oldest, most respected companies in our industry. Can you tell us, I mean, you've had a kind of roundabout way to become the CEO, not as traditional. You have a degree in metallurgic engineering Met yes metal met let's say it all together metallurgical engineering metallurgical got it okay there you go. i was trying to think this weekend i was like i wonder if paul if anyone's ever challenged paul to say that word five times fast a couple of times sober yeah. not sober i can do it so i bet <laughs> uh t tell us about your journey how did you get to where you are um you know, I, it, not not a normal path. Um, let's see, give you the medium medium story. So a couple of degrees in engineering, thought I was going to go be a university professor kind of dude, um, ran some research consortiums uh, for the university. Um, met my wife, you know, she's an electrical engineer. So we were we were we were, we were all into the engineering thing. Um, Decided that the university world wasn't for me. Ended up going to work for John Deere at their technical center, um, hitting all the high spots of Iowa and Illinois. But uh, you know, eventually started uh, moving through different assignments. And the kind of the the um, what what always turns me on and, and and gets me going is solving problems, right? So um, I just kept on solving one set of problems after another. And like electrical problems or mechanical problems or material problems are relatively easy, but the the most challenging systems and to and problems to solve are those that involve people, right? People are really squirrely, right? And so optimizing groups of people and getting them to all accomplish a common goal is like the most freaking interesting, fascinating challenge that there is, right? Yeah. And so kind of my career bent in, in that direction. And, and, uh, uh, the, at, at deer and then at Kohler, there's a, where I subsequently moved, there's about a 10 year phase of my life where I called myself the pony, the pony stall boy. And it was, here's a pile of poop, go clean it up. Um, 
So I just kept on going after uh, more and more challenging assignments because I was like, well, that's interesting. I wonder how you'd fix that. And uh, eventually, you know, I ended up um, president of a division that uh, made engines and then global responsibility and, and all that other stuff. And then I had an opportunity to go to Volrath, uh, which was the right, right time for me because I had a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old and, and literally at the time, um, I was flying around the world every two weeks. Uh, we were doing a opening up a joint venture in China and one in India. And uh, short story, but uh, my daughter, who's perhaps as outspoken as me, I was apologizing to her and my son and about not being somewhere. And she looked me in the eyes and said, "Dad, we don't expect you to be there, but we love you anyway." Um, so you want to you want to talk about a little uh, uh, knife to the heart? So I decided I got to do something uh, different. And then I had a chance to come to Volrath and and uh, had a great alignment uh, with the family that owns the company about this wacky idea that you could try to build a successful company that doesn't screw people mm-hmm. and uh, that equitably benefits our employees and shareholders and our customers and the communities we live and work in. So that was like, OK, that's something really cool yeah. to see if you can go do that. So that's what I've been doing. Wow. Um, is it that foreign to build a successful company from your history or what you see around that really wants to do right by people? You know, I think, um, you know, unfortunately, I think it's probably less common than more common. You know, mm-hmm. it, you know, publicly held companies uh, drive to quarterly expectations at, at Wall Street. And this is world according to Paul, right? Um, yep. Yep. You know, private equity companies, you know, they're looking to pump and dump in, you know, four to seven years. So no offense to anybody on this broadcast. Um, you know, so it's a tough environment to to make decisions about how to run a company and how to be as a company that benefit everybody, right? Not necessarily yep. equally. But, you know, in the long run, benefit those four key stakeholder groups. So doable, but you have to want to do it. Right. So I think all the time about something you can be passionate about and then that drives you like the passion of doing it, like uh, making a difference, uh, leaving a mark, uh, having a positive impact in the world, how that drives us, you know, getting wanting to run a successful company is one thing. And that's cool. And that's big. But add on that other component that does right by people that treats people right. That's a, that's big. Um, that's a big sense of meaning in making a difference that I have to think wakes you up every morning with a little bit of a fire inside, a lot of energy. Yeah, I mean, quite frankly, that probably turns me on more than running a successful company. And I mean, I think it's a it's a hell of a way to get there, right? And run a successful yeah. company. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, no, <laughs> I think we I said in our our talk before we started, you know. Nobody will ever accuse me of being a normal CEO, right? And and you know, at the <laughs> at the end of the day, we all die, right? Or we all retire, and three months after we retire, nobody remembers who the hell we are, right? So, you know, business leadership is is really a fleeting thing, right? But if you think about the ability to people to impact people's lives, and then you know, have them impact their kids' lives or other people's lives, kind of from a, a universe perspective. That's pretty cool, right? That's 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 real impact. Heck yeah, I I, uh, I love the big vision. I have to think that when you lay out that vision as the leader of Volrath, that if it impacts you and it impacts me, well, that's a hundred percent impact on the two folks on this call and everyone else watching. I mean, I have to think. I think that's just a universal thing that people can get behind and excite. So to put that out there has to make the energy of Volrath and amongst all your employees so powerful to do, to do good. Here, let me ask you a question. Um, as a, as a leader, we, we've, ah, we're still in uniquely challenging times. We, the last two years have all been, I guess there's always elements of challenge. If you look for it, is but, there something going on? I... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Allegedly. Um, I'm not sure I'm buying it, but you know, you said you're maybe an atypical CEO in some ways, maybe because of that piece, that because that human element and that bigger impact maybe means more than just the business in and of itself. But talk about in times of challenge, when there's uncertainty, when there's levels of chaos, 
which in employees and teammates or, or in ourselves can create fears or anxieties or whatever. Tell me from your perspective, what's been the most impactful leadership quality that you've tried to demonstrate or any leader that you think should demonstrate in, in times of real challenge? Wow, that's a good question, which I've learned how to say when I'm thinking of a decent answer. No, uh, you know, you know, I think, you know, and I and it's not so much my comment, I guess, will not be so much about me. But I, I think um, easy to be a leader when when things are good or be a supposed leader when things are good. Tough to be when a leader when things are challenging. Right. And I but you can't become a good leader when when the you know what's hitting the fan you have to have been a good leader before mm -hmm. because i think it's the equity you build up with the with the people you're leading that allows you to be a good leader on, on the on the uh downturn so if if people think that you're honest and you're ethical and you have their best interests in their heart and that you're doing the best you can to balance the needs of the company with the employees and your straight shooter and you know what you say actually happens you know all those you know things that you know one of my lines is uh you can't you, there's no leadership without followership right yeah you can you can manage people right but if you don't have followers you can't be a leader so i think all those things that make a good leader you can draw on those you know there's an analogy of uh you know, the, the bucket and the ladle and, you know, we all either ladle in each other's buckets or take out. And, you know, so if you enter in a downturn with a, you've filled everybody's buckets up over the last X number of years, you know, there's a lot you can draw from in tough times. Whereas if you haven't filled people's buckets up, there's nothing to draw from. Right. You know, so, you know, I, I, I think that's the, you know, it's it, tough times is, is when your leadership abilities and your quality as a leader really show through, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you haven't been walking the walk and and really focusing on being a good leader and really believing your job is to lead people, when times are tough, it's all going to fall apart. Yeah. So. I think that's a great answer. I used to be a history teacher. And I remember when I was kind of starting out that I don't know who gave me this advice, but they said, your job at the beginning of your teaching, like like when the year just starts, is to invest is like every person, every kid has an emotional bank account and your job is to invest as much in those bank accounts, make as many deposits as you can. So that at times when you need to make those withdrawals, um, that they'll, they know that you're willing to invest and, and it goes both ways. I love, I love that analogy. Um, you as a, as a person, as a, as a man, you're a leader. What are you, what are some disciplines you have in your life that keep you feeling mentally healthy that help you wh whatever that is in your world to keep you going probably four things off the top of my head three of them are in a group and and then uh one additional one i always find myself whenever i'm feeling not on my game i always reboot to sleep diet and exercise right because over the years i found if i'm not getting enough sleep if i'm not watching the quality of food I eat uh, and the amount I eat and I'm not exercising, I just spiral, continue to spiral down. Right. And, you know, yeah. then, you know, then, I'll, you know, <laughs> it kind of feeds on itself, you know, so I, I'm, I won't say constantly, but probably once or twice a year, I have to find myself kind of rebooting to, okay, am I going to bed? You know, really sexy stuff, right? Am I going to bed on time? You know, can I discipline myself to go run in the morning? You know, am I am I eating my six to eight servings of fruits and veggies a day? I mean, it really sounds ridiculous, but, you know, that's a found, super important physical foundation that if you don't have that kind of laid out, all the other stuff is pretty hard. Yep. And then my other structure, um, I think I might have shared this um, at FIDA, but um, 20, ooh, I'm getting old. Probably 25 years ago, I um, actually penned a personal mission statement. And so uh, it's a good engineering mission statement, right? Which means it's not flowery. It's got a whole bunch of bullet points to it. But um, I start every day off looking at it and wow. asking, asking myself, did I live that yesterday? And 
and how am I going to live it today? Holy cow. And, and, and for the visual, you know, here's, here's the original piece of paper from 25 years ago. Now it's in a computer file, right? But it doesn't have the same cachet as a beat up piece of paper. That's really awesome that that standard you created when you defined here's what matters, um, that you still live by that every single day. Or it just means I'm not creative enough to change. So one of the two. You you can create whatever yeah whatever uh, story you want to tell yourself out of it. But I'm going to stick with that's really impressive that 25 years ago you took the time to think about here's what matters and living this way. Um, if, if I can compare myself to this every day, know if I'm on course or on course when I need to adjust and and get back on course or whether I'm right on. There you go. It's been. You know, on course, it, it's kind of my true north, if you will. So I use it to kind of say, am I sailing in the right direction? I, I, I stinking love that. Um, you've got, you know, one of my, there's, there's so much that you, <clears throat> that you do, that you lead. You, you're, you're the CEO of Orath. You've got a farm where you're growing potatoes and hay and taking care of horses. You just gave a TED talk. Uh, let's talk about the TED talk real quick, because when I, I met you, by the way, here, let, I'm just going to give you my first impression of you. We met. Short, uh, bald, good looking. <laughs> it, it, no, was, no. it, all of, no, it was, it was, it was wonderful. I re, here's, here's how I remember it. We met at SIFA at the dinner. We sat at the same table. I was, uh, you know, like so knee deep in my notes. Cause I was going to give this talk, which I had never done. And I was like ready to vomit any moment. And I remember probably saying hi to everybody. You were Paul. I didn't know you for any, from anyone else other than, okay, hey, Paul is sitting at the table with me. Great. And, um, and then I challenged everybody to be authentic with something, to say, here's something I'm learning. Here's something that, you know, whatever I'm going through. And you have won maybe the first award. And, you know, you're going up. I'm like, oh, he's with Volrath. You know, he's, you know, he's maybe a big deal kind of here. You get up there and you accept this award and you followed the lead and you said, you know what? something I'm realizing maybe I need to work on is a lot of the things I learned about, or I was re really grounded in, in COVID reminded of what really matters that maybe as we're getting back into the busyness of things and what we're used to, maybe I've forgotten some of those. And it was this moment of just real authenticity that, um, I mean, that set the tone for the whole night, Paul. Um, and I mean, it opened a door cause I can ask people to do something and very often, I mean, you know, in my home, this is the case all the time. Hey, you know, clean your clothes, clean, do the laundry, put your dishes away. Yeah, good luck there. But, um, but you followed, opened the door, and a lot of other people came out with really authentic moments. Um, do you remember that? Uh, you know, now that you say that, yes, but no, until we just talked about it. So I don't keep I don't keep track of half the shit that comes out of my mouth. Here, so come on. <laughs> well, here's what I want to know most people wouldn't do that. Most wouldn't be that vulnerable and share that thing of, Hey, here's where maybe I'm regressing a little bit, or I need to re be reminded of certain things. Has that authentic piece of you always been there? Was there a, a moment that you're like, you know what? I, I don't, I, I don't need to BS people in life. I just need to be me and be the real deal. Um, let's see. There's somewhere, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, well, if, if you look at my mission statement, there's a bullet point. Of, I will cherish my personality, including my sense of humor and care towards others. So, um, so that's awesome, Paul. No, no, I, I, you know, um, I was lucky enough many years ago to, um, get pretty comfortable with mm -hmm. who I am and, and, you know, not to say it's a completed project, but, um, to really get clear on who who I am and what I wanted to be, and 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 really to to get okay with the fact that you know that was more important than you know other um, external measures of success, maybe. Wow. Um, deep. Oh man, it got deep all of a sudden. Oh, it totally got deep. Um, I feel like I need some forks and a skid steer to pull this off and and know what to do with it. Um, what getting clear on who you just wanted to be, not the 
all the external definitions of success, but who you were liking yourself, being comfortable in your own skin. Uh, why was that so important to you? You know, I probably at the time I was at um, when I went through that, I was at John Deere and they they put a whole bunch of uh, training in a couple of us in terms of teaching us how to be life coaches and understanding how people tick. And and, you know, about the same time I you know, we were going to have our first kid. And so and at the same time, I was really kind of caught up in the corporate rat race and, you know, kind of definite, you know, external, externally driven definition of success. And, you know, not that I'm a hippy dippy, right. I like success. I, you know, I like nice vacations and, and, and everything like that. But, um, it was just a point in time in my life where I felt like I had a fork in the road. Right. And, yeah, and I, and I could choose, choose to go left or right. And left was going to become a corporate drone and, you know, wake up 20 or 30 years later and go, what the hell? So I, I chose not to take that path. Paul, I love it. I think it's uh, I think it's beautiful. Uh, this is Tom Lyons. Yo, brother. What's up, Tom? Tom is with, <clears throat> excuse me, I think VP of college universities with Cisco. Yo, Tom. Uh, Alyssa is in the house. Alyssa from Excel. Uh, yo, Alyssa. Hey, friend. Wow. Gail Thwain is here. Matthew Arthur is here. Mitch Cohen. Nathan Sugar. Bolt is in the house. So awesome. This is our buddy, Joe Carcioni with Nemco. What does Joe have to say? Listen to, listen, what a great company to someone. Wait, listen, what a great company to somewhat compete with here at Nemco. Volrath is an awesome competitor and great company we respect and follow. Some great companies up there, uh, a few hours north of us, Hoosiers and the Buckeyes. Oh, as long as we don't start talking smack about football or basketball, we'll be a okay. <laughs> We're gonna make it. Uh, Jill uh, Van Mengsel is in the house. I love it. Tom Lyons with Cisco with a question: How do you decide what to focus on every day with so many distractions? I'm guessing part of it might go back to that mission statement to some degree. Um, you know, yeah, um, but you know the. Uh, you know, from a business perspective, um, there's a, you know, one of the challenges I think we all face, right, is the critical few versus the vital many and busyness. And we're all bombarded by emails and texts and everything else like that. And there's, there's this great book. I, I forget who the heck wrote it, but it's easy read. So, you know, salespeople should be able to get their way through it. Um, that's like a joke, guys. Um <laughs> But no. I, I think I think the title is like Eat the Frog First or something. Oh, yeah. Eat like the that. Frog. And, you know, I read that and that really resonated with me about, you know what, pick the pick the high leverage things, you know, spend some time to think every day, plan your day and then pick the two or three high leverage things that are going to make the most difference and then drive those through and then get to the rest of the stuff. And uh I think that's the, you know, that's the only way to get through it, right? Because none of us, none of us can ever get everything done in a day. There's always a huge file of work at the end of the day, huge email queue, and not to get distracted by the kind of the BS of, oh, I want an, e you know, empty email queue or, you know, um, you know, get distracted by the urgent versus the critical. So, you know, to me, it's in taking the time to plan, be deliberate. You know, be planful and go after the high leverage things every day and, and force yourself to pick the two or three. Yeah, love it. It is a choice. You, you, you do have to force because you could get lost in everything. Suzanne, Paul was always great around customers, consultants, because he wasn't a corporate puke. <laughs> if <laughs> ever you, there were a compliment, I love it. There we go. That's so great. Suzanne, you make me smile. Holy cow. Um, yeah, Suzanne made me smile and she made me cry. So. It was the whole whole emotional gamut sometimes. How did I love Suzanne, you, Suzanne. Got it. Okay. Um, when did she make you cry? Oh, <laughs> oh. she was uh, she was a woman of high standards. Love it. And high expectations. So and she wasn't afraid of sharing those high expectations. So way no, to go, it Suzanne. Was, it was an awesome, awesome time working with her. Absolutely zero. Zero regrets that she and I work together. 
I love it. Suzanne, keep the standards high. Um, okay, so you just gave a TED Talk. Yep. I, I don't know how you have energy for all of it, but it was on the virtuous cycle, right? Yeah. Talk about the virtuous cycle. Well, that was a title I got stuck with, but no, it was... Um, no, it was really, the, the talk was really, first of all, a cool experience because uh, I don't have any trouble talking, but the, the TED Talk format's super challenging because you got to be super crisp on, on delivering your message. So it was a fascinating skill set to learn, but it, it was really centered around this concept of uh, personal innovation and, you know, the, the virtuous cycle or cycle we go through, which is, which is super natural for children, right? You, you think about it. Kids are constantly innovating themselves to the point where they drive us nuts, right? You know, I want to learn how to do the violin. I want to do this. I want to do that. And, you know, and they're just spinning through, you know, picking a target, trying it, you know, succeeding or failing, learning from that. And they just go around that circle, right? And uh, then as we all get in, you know, start growing up, these external pressures start hitting us. Some of them are biological because our, our brains tend to reward um, success, right, with uh, good chemicals and failure with bad chemicals, which, you know, is probably a great survival mechanism in the saber-toothed tiger days, right, you know, but uh, not so good on innovation, personal innovation. And, you know, then, you know, society starts grinding it down, GPAs, and if I fail on this job assignment, I won't get a promotion or whatever. And, you know, for a lot of people, you know, you get to 25 or 30 or 35 and, 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 our personal innovation, personal innovation either slows down or, or almost, or stops. And I can't think of anything more tragic, right. Than you're 30 or 35 and you're, that's it. You are who you are. You're like, Oh my God, you know, you're, you're 30, 40 years of that. And, and so it really it was walking, the talk was walking people through that and then giving them some hints and objectives to, and tool sets to, to kind of reboot that and, and get it going. And you're a great, um, example of that, Jason, where, you know, just think about how much richer your life is because you did the personal innovation around the FSPN, right? Think about it. I mean, think about how cool you, your life is, the experiences, the networks, the, the learning, the, the social affirmation. Just think of that, right? Right. Now imagine you do one of those personal innovations every year. Think how different your life would be five years from now, right? And then you reflect back and, you know, maybe, you know, you weren't innovating yourself. And a lot of times we BS ourselves with, you know, professional development and stuff like that. But that's not really personal innovation, right? So that was kind of the, the text of it was, you know, really to try to walk people through that, get force them to take a step back and say, am I happy with my level of personal innovation? And if not to kind of go out and do something about it. You know, I think uh, this is so huge to me, by the way, this is Jill. Uh, I learned that Paul still focuses on innovating himself. That is the fuel that makes him a great leader. I stink and love it. Jennifer Rolanders in the house. Jennifer. Jennifer. Um, I love it. Uh, Jill. I love it. Thank you. You know, this, this thing that you're talking about to me is one of the greatest gifts in life. And when it, like to your point, when people, let's say they turn 35 and they think I'm done, you know, nothing can happen after 30, after 40, like I'm not still creating. I'm not, they, it's almost like they lose curiosity to me. I think it's that curiosity for like, I wonder if I go down this rabbit hole, how much life it might bring or how much joy or how much, whatever those things are. And I think it was Rob Connolly when, when I said curiosity is the fountain of youth and this desire to learn and grow. And I think it is one of the most key components to me waking up in the morning. And I think about this with you because you also volunteer, you do all these things. And I'm like, how does that fire stay lit? I think it's this that keeps it that fire lit in you. Yeah, I, I, a lot of caffeine and a lot of motivation. One of the two. <laughs> it's, you, you know, and you're, and you're right. I mean, for me, the power plant network, which came out of no, you know, which came out of, was born in a time of hardship and levels of fear and finding a way to serve that was unique. And I was scared crapless that I would get laughed out of the industry the way I was doing it. But, um, no, still there, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, it's <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh yeah, we still got plenty of time. I love it. It's you know you're right. It opens doors that you can, that I never imagined. Not just opens doors, but it's been a source of um, incredible joy to participate with the industry in a different way that I never would have experienced. You know, offering extra fives and and talking about product. So why is it always an extra five, right? Why not an extra three, an extra seven? Why is this industry an extra five? Come on. We can be more creative. Know. When I when I was with my old company, just speak, and I got my partner, Bobby Moshe. The first thing, like we get together in the office, he goes, Listen, for what it's worth, I don't do fives. I'll do fours, I'll do sixes, never fives. And um Great. I love it. Oh, five, five and freight, Tom says. Who's this? <laughs> uh, this is awesome. I love it. Five and freight. Um, okay, so yeah, yeah, I love the that curiosity that was in you and always in me, that personal innovation. Talk about you, you also obviously care about contributing to the world in a, in a positive way. Um, lifting it up, leaving it better. You served for at least a decade on the Wisconsin Boys and Girls Club, correct? Yep. You were just inducted into their Hall of Fame. Talk talk to me. I, I guess maybe you could speak a little bit about to the Boys and Girls Club, because I don't know a ton about it, but also I'd love to know why service, the way you, you know, that level of service means, means something to you. Um, well, like a lot of things in life, right? It goes back to how you're raised. And um, I was raised in, in by parents who, used to always talk about time, talent, and treasure, right? And, and you give back to your community and time, talent, and treasure, right? So, um, you know, uh, you know, obviously it's easy to donate money and we're all given talents, right? Uh, and you, you use those talents and put time in, into the community. And, and you know, for me, um, high leverage, right? That, that theme again, I've always had probably for 20 or 30, 20 or 30 years, um, you know, the high leverage is education to me and kids, right? You know, so if you think about if you, if you can alter the course of a kid, right, early on in their life, that leverage for when they're 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 is huge, right? Yeah. Change that, change that slope, change that trajectory of their life. So I've always been, you know, kind of focused on, you know, early childhood education, um, providing, you know, boys and girls club providing, you know, safe spaces and after school education for, you know, kids that are coming from fractured families, um, you know, uh, coaching youth activities. Uh, you know, one of my gigs now is uh, kind of in the good food, organic world of, of, of providing um, kids nutritional education uh, in the schools where they don't really understand what good food is, what, you know, healthy eating, healthy eating is. So, putting together a nonprofit to uh, kind of drive that out into the school systems and provide that, provide that education. So for me, it's always about kind of that leverage and, you know, that it's kids and education, right. And, and you may be noticing a common theme in my life about, you know, how do I, how do I use my gifts to, to impact uh, the lives of others and kind of change their trajectories and make a difference. Paul, I think it's uh, amazing the ways that you serve and you make a difference. Um, you know, it could be really easy to do what you do, run a, a, an impressive company and call it a day because that takes a lot of energy. But you continue to find other ways to serve, to give, to contribute, uh, to grow. And I think it's an unbelievable example um, for anyone watching. Who's this? This is um, this is Gail Swain. Gail from Canberra. Hey, Gail. Hi, Gail. The Boys and Girls Club was a godsend for this single mom when my girls were in grade school. It saved us. Wow. Bingo. Making a difference. That's um, cool. Right? I, I think all the time about that. I don't know if it's if it's the starfish story. You, you know, like there's people that don't go out and give or care or listen or serve because they're like, oh, what could I do? What impact could I have? And Gail right there. Boom. Um, for that mom and her kids, her girls, um, it made a difference. You know, the guy that is throwing one starfish back at a time and someone says you can never throw them all back. Nope. But it made a difference for that one. And Gail, I love that it was you. 
So that's that's a, not the starfish story where you pull the legs off one at a time. No, I don't. I don't think it was that. One. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the other one. That's a different one. Different one. Yeah, there's all these starfish on the beach, and this guy goes out and he starts grabbing starfish, and they all washed up on shore. And he starts throwing them back, and someone's like, "Man, there's like thousands here. Why are you even trying this? It's not going to make a difference." And for everyone who threw it back, he said, "You know what? It made a difference for that one." And ultimately, it's about individuals making a difference in one for Gail, one family's life, uh, and that is huge. For Gail and her daughters. I love this. Um, bravo, Jennifer. So important to give back. Um, this is so fun, Paul. Um, okay, are, are you seem like someone um, who's who, who you seem like you carry a fair level of confidence uh, of your belief in your ability to figure it out? But confidence is often built simply through having to work through things in the past, right? We had to figure things out. We had to survive some challenges. Was there a challenge in your life that you overcame, that you worked through, that sort of taught you, you know what, holy cow, I can I can carry this. Is that what it takes? Well, I either fake it really well or, you know, I was able to find a fantastic woman to marry despite being short and bald, right? So that, that was a challenge in my life, but uh, <laughs> no. Um, no, I, I, you know, that's a great question. I, I think, um, um, you know, there were, there was really never any, um, tremendous, like formative, you know, I had a, had a, you know, hike through the woods and bare feet and, you know, through a blizzard or some, you know, some, some, some challenge, but I, I think, um, you know, I, <clears throat> one, one of the advantages of, of being willing to take risks is you get, really maybe not comfortable with failure but you understand that failure um doesn't define you or isn't the end of the world right so um and in fact can kind of propel you forward so you know i was i was fortunate probably in early enough in my my life cycle to experience and try enough things and suck at enough things and and not you know not be successful and and uh you know kind of pick myself and dig you know move forward to understand the the world the world doesn't end if you fail on something or if you don't uh uh you know hit the marks that as as high as you should have so i i, I think you know i think that's part of it becoming comfortable with failure and then i you know then i think from a business perspective you know we really all owe Sometimes it's fast. I mean, I always joke about, you know, not remembering what the heck I say. And sometimes it freaks me out because what we say impacts people's lives so much. Yeah. Um, but um, I had a guy working for me probably, shoot, 20, 25 years ago, ex-military guy. And I was just jumping on a shit someday um, over a production issue. And, and he looked at me straight in the eyes and he said, you know, in all respect, Paul, he said, have you ever had to order people to their death? He was an ex-military guy. And I said, no. And he goes, well, I have. And he said, so excuse me if I don't take what we're talking about with the same level of gravity that you do. And at first I was really kind of pissed off. <laughs> but then I, I kind of chewed on for a couple of seconds and I went, holy shit, you know, the dude's right. And, you know, that's one of the things that has stuck with me I'd, I'd, on kind of the business side of, you know what? I mean, at the end of the day, it's just business. It's, you know, nobody's going to die, um, you know, so, you know, so, you know, maybe that's not confidence, but maybe it's just less of a fear of failing. Right. And you take the fear away and and it takes a lot of stress out and allows you to kind of chill out about a lot of stuff and, and just move forward. So I, it's probably not a, like a dramatic uh, revelation, but at least that's the way I think I tick. Paul, I love it. And I think that that, I mean, I think that fear of failure is what prevents a ton of people from that virtuous cycle that you talk about that, you know, innovating into in our thirties and our forties, always coming up with something new or trying something new because people are so afraid of this idea of failure. I, one of my, favorite quotes was Edison, you know, when talking about the electric light bulb, he said, I didn't, 
I never failed. I just found 10,000 ways that didn't work. Um, you know, I learned that what doesn't work and that doesn't work. But if he had carried the failure word and the shame that can come with that, and I'm less than, oh, yeah. or I'm a, I'm a dummy or whatever, then he probably wouldn't have pressed on. And so if you can look at failure simply as, well, guess what? That one didn't work, but I tried something. Um, I think that's a gift. The, uh, this is our friend. Is this Gail again? Gail. I love it. Gail. My older daughter developed a love of gymnastics at the boys and girls club. And now as a mom in her own right, she took up silks and trapeze as her outlet from raising her two girls. The gift just kept giving. She loves oh, cool. hanging upside down from the even bars. So that's her outlet. So <laughs> great. Man, it's, uh, it's got to be fun to know the ways in which the organizations we serve and the ways you serve really impact. It's these stories that make all the difference. Gail, I love it. I love that she's holding on the things she learned as a kid and things that she, you know, I'm, I'm given a message later this week. And one of the, the, one of the first points is what do you love? What brings you joy? Because so often in our lives, particularly I think in times of chaos and challenge and everything, the, one of the first things to go is just the simple things we love, the things that bring us joy. And it's going back and realizing what did I love as a kid, maybe even, or what makes me smile and making sure we incorporate that into today to keep feeling that sense of, of aliveness. You keep preaching, brother. There you go. It, well, it's, I, I think it's something that you're doing. I, I think, you know, oh, you look at you. Yeah. You're, you're, you're I'm with you. I'm with you on this. Yeah. One. We're on the same page, Paul. I, I can't <laughs> wait to pull to make the potatoes out of the ground with you someday, man. I can't wait. Um, this is so great. Um, okay. So let's talk passion. Let's talk joy. You've got, tell me how many kids you have. Two, uh, a daughter who's 22 and a son who's 20. Okay. Daughter and a son. Awesome. Um, so they're moving on. Are they out of the house now? Thank God. I mean, yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So they're, Thank God. No, there we go. In, in all honesty, one of the one of the gifts of COVID, like a lot of COVID sucked, right? Yeah. But we did have them back in our lives, you know. And for those of us who have had kids through that stage of life, right? They're eighteen, they disappear, they go away to college, they don't really come back. So we were blessed with, you know, probably another year, year and a half of uh, our kids being in our lives. But that was enough. They could then move on, right? You know? There we um, go. Yeah. You know, coming down in the morning and having the kitchen still in the same shape as it was when I went to bed, that's pretty cool now. So I bet. Uh I yeah, someday I'm far away off from that, but someday. Um, so as, as they're getting ready to go to college, to school, or whatever they were doing next, they were getting ready to leave the house, maybe enter the workforce. And I think about this a lot for, for a lot of our younger friends in the industry coming in. There's there's oftentimes this belief, which I don't think is is always true, but do I go pursue a passion that I love um, or do I go away, you know, do I go a direction in my career that makes sense? It's functional. There's a, there's an obvious path as you are guiding your kids, as they're getting ready to leave the home and go do whatever study work. Was there any advice you gave them in terms of that balance or what, what to pursue? Let's see. Don't come back. No, um, <laughs> no, that, no, you know, I, I think, uh, again, um, you know, <laughs> I'm thinking anybody who gives parenting advice is a loser, right? In terms of, because parenting is a tough, 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 tough world. But I, I think, you know, my first thing is I think kids are super perceptive, right? Um, so you can give them some going away advice, but what really matters is, the behavior you modeled for the 18 years they were home, right? So you can you can say anything, but they're going to look at what you actually did, and for better or worse, that's what they're going to model their lives after. But you know, I, I think there's a um, you know if there's a if there's if there's a theme, I guess in our world, it's to uh, you know um, be true to yourself, be honest, be ethical, work hard and try to understand what your passion is but um that may take a while to get there right and and you know one thing i talk to my kids a lot of if 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 you're happy with your life you wouldn't want to do anything over or differently 
but what is key is that when you reach all those decision points that you have some framework to decide are you going to take the left fork in the road or the right fork of the road because if we if we all look back and you know assuming you know jason assuming you're fairly happy where you are looking backwards you can see where seven or ten or fifteen decisions got you to where you are now right there's no way in heck you could have ever planned that path or most of us can't plan that path but you did make more often than not the decisions that were right for you and what you think is important so that's that's what we always try to stress which is you're going to make decisions so understand who you are and what's right for you and when you reach the decision points make the decisions based on that yeah i love it i i love that framework um I, I, it's it's impossible to know where you'll be 10 years from now because you don't know the events that will pop up in your life and you, you know the mission statement that you're that we're all creating whether we've written it down or not whether we know it or not that will help guide us as those different events pop up and the changes we need to make along the way um this got serious all of a sudden. Wow, geez. All right, let's light it up, Paul. Let's light it up. Okay. Uh, do you cook? Yes. Okay, so it's a it you're 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 planning your Sunday, you're gonna go harvest the hay, you're gonna ride the horse, you're gonna pull the potatoes, and you're gonna figure out what's for dinner on a nice fall afternoon where it's getting darker now than uh, than we're used to. What are you making? What's like your comfort? fall afternoon Sunday food? You know, fall and winter, absolutely my favorite uh, seasons to cook in. I love like hearty soups, hearty stews, you know, that, uh, you know, take a while to prep and then a while to cook down. So, you know, you're watching, watching the football game or, you know, hanging on the couch, reading a book and they're kind of cooking down and filling, you know, filling the house with uh, great smells as, as the afternoon goes on. And, you know, um, that combined with a, you know, a good, uh, loaf of freshly made bread, mm, good stuff, good Love stuff. It. Solid answer. Um, three things that are on Paul's bucket list that you haven't done that you're still like, oh man, I can't wait. Someday I'm going to do this. Hike the Appalachian, through hike the Appalachian trail, north to south, uh, climb, uh, Mount Kimler Jarrow and they do the great loop route uh, in a boat from uh, which is through the great lakes down the eastern seaboard back up through the through the gulf of mexico back up through mississippi whoa i didn't know that was even a thing that is a thing old retired people do it all the time and i want to be an old retired person someday i bet you'll be great at it um are you do you do you boat yes i have a bad boating habit uh, so is it a sailboat? Um, like I said, I have a bad boating habit. No, um, <laughs> no, my, 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 uh, wife and I, um, still race a 19 foot sailboat. We've done that. We've sailed competitively together for, I don't know, you know 30 years. Um, and then we had a family cruising boat that we cruise, that we, the kids grew up on in the, uh, in the uh uh in the summers and and what else then i run help run a help run a uh, offshore sailing racing kids program with uh disadvantaged youth that uh, we get them out there and teach them independence and skill sets out in the great Lakes. so yeah i got a bad sailing habit it's pretty rad these themes of um contribution and your joy run throughout and uh i i just i don't know i love i love the way you're and i love the way you're doing life it's a great model it's the way you describe where you're at i'm probably i don't know how old you are you hold you are but i'm probably 10 years behind you based on my kids age somewhere about yeah. that and um and so i i i hope that all the curiosities and the ways you continue to invest in your own journey and your own joy and of those around you. Um, I hope I follow in those footsteps because they're really fun. I love it. it. Brings me life. Um, 
in uh, when, when that day comes that you're boating up out of the lakes and down the Atlantic and back up the Mississippi and you're out of food service, you're not worrying about pots and pans or, you know, equipment or any of that stuff anymore. Um, what do you hope the industry looks back at your journey and says, do you ever think about legacy or, or what you hope they say? You know, I, I think my honest question or honest answer to that, which is kind of no BS is, I hope they don't say much about me. Hmm. I would hope that, uh, you know, maybe my impact on Volrath and Volrath continues to be a great company with, with a great culture, but, um, you know, I, I, business leadership, fame, that kind of stuff is fleeting, right? So mm -hmm. I, I would I would be, it sounds weird, but I'd be disappointed if people referred to me as having some legacy. To me, success would be that what I've worked on and the people I've worked with and helped develop, that uh, that would be my legacy. And and I'm I'm cool being kind of the quiet Midwestern person that doesn't need a lot of credit for that. So. So success and legacy would be that I've made a difference, but nobody knows. How's that for an answer? I think it's beautiful. I love it. Um, and in jest and fun, to me, you'll always be the guy that helped perfect the bidet. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, you, you know, someday, someday we can uh, swap stories about, uh, you know, how we installed the first uh, uh, toilet with radar in our house. So just <laughs> I, true story. I, I, I don't even know what that means. Like, I can't put those two words together. Toilet and radar make no sense. In well, yeah, you, you had to have a sensor in it that would uh, detect a human butt. And uh, <laughs> a, radar, a radar unit was the only form at that time that was successful. And, and the product never launched because we could not get the toilet certified to the FAA re requirements. So, okay. Because it would that interfere with the... Uh, aircraft so, <laughs> so there it. you go didn't think yeah. that story was coming up you don't want uh, someone going number two inter interfering with aircraft uh that's for sure uh who's this this is uh chris falari chef chris with guggenheimer yo chef so glad to be with you paul listen um real quick i i just i, I um there were different friends who reached out people were really excited i talked to one gentleman when i was telling him you know him and uh, he works in Denver and we, he goes, hey, you're having Paul on. And I said, yeah. And he goes, you know, that uh, I'm like, you don't need accolades. I get it. But uh, he goes, he is one of the he goes, he is one of the most unique people who mixes unbelievable <laughs> intelligence and smarts with empathy and cares. He goes, and that makes him one of the top people in this industry that I would ever follow. Um, or go somewhere for because of how you mix those two, which I think is beautiful. A couple, uh, a few other friends connect with me just on kind of uh, what you've meant and Volrath kind of means to the industry. Kara Shalarov with pride. Um, I, I, uh, I can tell a lot about an organization by its leadership. Well, I've had uh, uh, limited interaction with Paul. I'm a firm believer that the company culture is driven from the top down. And it's clear that he has set the tone for the company and everyone who represents it. I've always experienced very professional and respectful interactions with everyone at Bullrath. The commitment to high standards, quality of not just products, but the overall experience with their brand is authentic and never wavering. It is clear he values and invests in the future of our industry, uh, whether it's internship programs at Volrath or taking time to share his experiences with the young industry panel at FIDA. I have tremendous respect for Paul and the impact that he's made on the industry. Um, one of our mutual friends, David Ellingson. I learned something every time I speak. He, David kind of reminds me of you. Uh, you know, this... Um, wow, okay. I, I say that in a, in a really um, authentic meaning... He's, um, David's a really smart guy, uh, runs a impactful company that leads our industry, um, and does it with empathy. There is a lot of care, David and Eric and what they're doing and what they're building. Um, and really funny, uh, you know, you know, those guys, David and Eric, uh, David said, I learned something every time I speak with Paul, his intelligence, 
His background and his long-term approach to our industry is refreshing in a rapidly changing world. Vorath has been a longtime industry leader in products, but in addition, Paul is a thought leader for many of us. He shows respect to people inside and outside of his organization, and the food service and equipment supply community is lucky to have Paul a part of it. Um, Paul, wow. you know, man, I'm just really grateful for you. I'm grateful for uh, you being you in uh, the funny moments and the joy and the compassion and uh, the thoughtfulness. Thanks for giving us an hour tonight. No, it's my my pleasure, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, everybody who was uh, who joined us, they got a couple of good nuggets, and and uh, if people got a takeaway from from our conversation, even if it's a, I don't want to turn out to be a short old bald guy like that, right? It was, it was a successful night, but no, it was awesome. I had a great time. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. This is great. Who's the? Uh, let's see who we got. This is, um, boom, boom, boom. Uh, Jeff Yates is in the house. Nothing like a tall glass of juice. We start your week off at ball. I love it. Jeff, what's up, brother? From San Francisco, Jennifer Rolander. Thanks, Jason, for making this interview happen. And a big thanks to Paul for taking the time to talk with all of us. Great to see you again. Uh, this is our friend. Who's this? Oh, great conversation. Oh, this is Jill from Volrath. Great conversation. And thanks for the platform. Love it. This is Chris. Uh, Chris Gorey from Volrath. Great talk. Thanks, Jason, Paul, Chris. Love that you're here, my friend. Listen, Food Service Power Plant Network, um, there were so many moments of insight that, I mean, notes that I've got. I'll show you some of mine. Boom. At the top of my sheet, that's where I take my notes. Things that Paul mentioned that impacted me, that affected me in a way that you know, I, uh, if we think we can't change once we're past 35 or 40, I'm 43. And I will tell you tonight's conversation is going to direct my course a little bit differently, whether it's being a little bit more thoughtful or having my own personal mission statement that guides me. That's my left and my right or my North star, whether that's making sure I continue to cultivate curiosity and then their desire to learn and grow and uh, innovate in my own life, whether it's who I want to be, whether it's innovating in the ways to contribute to society or the industry or my own family, whatever those things are, um, whether it's making sure I have things that bring me joy and I continue to do them like boating or hay or, uh, you know, all the things in Paul's life that I oftentimes get so busy being in, you know, being at cow mill or being in the industry or regional or being a dad, it can be easy to lose focus on those things. So many things matter. So I hope you've got something in your own journey uh, to run with and grow with. Uh, and, and the other thing I think I would say is that the importance of remaining authentic, that it's, it's okay to share moments where I'm learning something that I need to grow or insights that I've got or being me along the way. Paul talked about um, a moment in time where he decided that he, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he wanted to be comfortable in his own skin, that he wanted to like himself and know himself and really be proud of who we, he was, as opposed to some of these other things that many people search for, which remains something in, in my life, being comfortable in my skin, just liking me matters. Um, and hopefully it does to you. So keep going in your journey, keep grinding, keep having fun, keep bringing the joy, keep serving in our community and in the industry and in this network, keep lifting one another up. That's why this has been such a special place I stinking love this. Who's this? Let's just read a few more. Uh, J.R. Weber. J.R., what's up, brother? Uh, this is Jeff. Thanks for, uh, Jason Paul, your commitment to the industry. Heck, yes. Your friend, Suzanne. Both of our friends, much <laughs> appreciated. Great to see you, Paul. Suzanne, you make a smile. Love it. Everyone, Food Service Power Plant Network, have an awesome night. We'll see you soon. Paul, thanks again, brother. Thank you, everybody. Hang out.